is what you're going to pay me? <laughs> All right. Can everyone hear me okay? How's the sound? A little louder? Okay. I'll be, I'll be loud. This is our session on the National Counterterrorism Center, NCTC. Um, we are going to forego opening statements. I will simply give a brief introduction of our three terrific panelists, and then we'll begin a moderated dialogue that will go on for some time before we open it to the floor for uh, group questions. Um, on, on the far right, uh, Mike Allen, who, is, who, as you know, is one of the co-conveners and co-hosts of this event, uh, is himself one of our panelists here. Mike has had a long and distinguished career uh, on these issues. From 2011 to 2013, mm -hmm. Mike served as the Majority Staff Director of HIPSI, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Uh, prior to joining HIPSI, he was Director for the Bipartisan Policy Center's uh, successor to the 9-11 Commission, the, the National Security Preparedness Group, uh, co-chaired by uh, Hamilton and Keene. Before that, he served in the White House for seven years in a variety of policy and legislative roles. Um, at NSC, he served as Special Assistant to the President, Senior Director for Counterproliferation Strategy from 07 to early 09, uh, under Steve Hadley, from whom we just heard, uh, previously Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Legislative Affairs from 05 to 07. Uh, from 01 to 05, he had uh, been in the Legislative Affairs Office of the White House's Homeland Security Council as Special Assistant to the President for Legislative Affairs. Uh, he was heavily involved in many of the matters we've been talking about. And as you know, author of The Indispensable Blinking Red. <laughs> That's right. wow. See? It's on, it's on Amazon. Yeah. The, the, co <laughs> <laughs> the conference is getting a commission on every sale, right? Uh, to, to my immediate right, Matt Olson, who has just recently stepped down as director of the NCTC, a position he held from 2011 until 2014. Prior to leading NCTC, Matt was general counsel of the NSA. You take some interesting jobs, mm -hmm. Matt. Uh, before being the general counsel at NSA, he was an associate deputy attorney general at the Justice Department in the National Security Division. Um, among the many different things he did in justi the Justice Department, uh, serving as the executive director of the Guantanamo Review Task Force. Um, uh, I could go on about his, his accomplishments, in, including service as a federal prosecutor. Uh, in the interest of quickly getting to the questions, let me then move to the middle here. Juan Zarate, my law school classmate. Juan, always nice to see you. Five bucks. Bob. Yes. Uh, here's your five bucks. Juan. <laughs> 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 I'll take a plug. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, give you a, I'll give you some softball questions. How about go, that? Um, Juan is a, currently a senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. Uh, he's a national security analyst, the senior national security analyst for CBS News. And I believe you have your own show called Flashpoints on uh, cbsnews.com. Uh, and he's chairman and co-founder of the Financial Integrity Network. Juan had served as Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy National Security Advisor for Combating Terrorism from 2005 to 2009 and had been the first ever Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Terrorist Financing and Financial Crimes. He too is a former federal prosecutor who was involved in terrorism prosecution prior to 2011, including the uh, prosecution and investigation associated with the attack on the USS Cole. He too has a book that you need to check out. It's <laughs> Treasury's War the unleashing of a new era of financial warfare from 2013. And now, without further ado, let's get into the substantive discussion. I, I thought it might be best to begin actually with Mike Allen. And Mike, uh, drawing on Blinking Red, just tell us what was the rationale for creating NCTC? What sort of thought went into that? I, I think everyone agreed with numerous analyses of what had happened and what went wrong on 9-11 which is primarily there was a failure to share information collected <coughs> abroad, intelligence collected abroad, and fuse it together with information that was in the possession of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The 9-11 Commission tells this story very well. Of course, the Congress had also discovered it, as had many other Bush administration reviews. So the idea was to create a new entity where you could bring together information that had previously, on the domestic side, been more in the realm of law enforcement sensitive information that would be used for a prosecution and put it together 
with foreign intelligence usually collected by the CIA. Because the idea after we examined what went wrong on 9-11 was that our enemies now were using the exact same devices and methods as we were and then able to enter to the United States and get on airplanes and, and commit the acts that they committed on September 11th. So I think the NCTC was the fruition of numerous calls immediately after 9-11 for a fusion center, over and over and over a fusion center. And that's what the NCTC's primary purpose is and was. Okay, so let, let me turn to Matt and ask Matt to give us a, uh, a sur an institutional org chart style survey of what NCTC actually is, all the many component parts and directorates, and, and without really stopping to get into the details of the pros and cons and so forth, just orient the crowd towards this. Sure. Um, so let me just say at, at the outset, I, I feel a little bit, I was thinking about this, I feel a little bit like Ebenezer Scrooge with the ghosts of Intel reform past, present, and future <laughs> all around me. <laughs> and I, and I'm, I'm Ebenezer Scrooge being judged, being shown, you know, have we done what we were supposed to do? Our, what's our future look like? That's right. Um, <laughs> so, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's great to be here. And, and so I, yeah, I'll give a very brief kind of nuts and bolts uh, uh, description of, you know, what we look like as an organization. You know, I would say sort of four uh, principal responsibilities. Uh, first and foremost, in reflecting our biggest organization within NCTC, is intelligence analysis. We're the primary organization in the United States government for the analysis of terrorism information. Um, so the biggest organization within NCTC is made up of, of intel analysts drawn from around uh, the community. Um, the second, a second mission is watch listing. Uh, one of the reforms really, uh, and uh, observations of the 9-11 Commission, there were a number of different watch lists within the government before 9-11. There needed to be one consolidated list of all known and suspected terrorists. NCTC has the responsibility for maintaining that uh, database of known and suspected terrorists. Uh, a third mission that we've talked a lot about over the last couple of days is uh, warning and situational awareness. And we, put, we have a whole organization devoted really just to making sure that we have immediate and, and uh, uh, well-shared threat information and awareness, then, and we run uh, a number of different ways, and we do that a number of different ways, but it's more of a, uh, a, a threat-based situational awareness uh, responsibility. And then the fourth, and I know we'll talk a little about this, is, uh, is different from those, and it's, it's not really an intelligence function, and that's our uh, strategic operational planning, uh, where we're responsible for making sure that there's a whole of government approach that's integrated and, and synchronized to our counterterrorism activities. So those are the sort of four main areas of responsibility. Okay, so what I thought we might do is pick these off one by one and spend a little bit of time unpacking each of the major areas. And uh, just mainly because it's sort of the one that interests me most, I thought we'd start with strategic operational planning. Um, and, and Juan, I wanted to ask you uh, to think about this from the NSC staff perspective um, and, and, and the, the interagency management that ordinarily goes on in that respect. Why? Why was there a need for some new entity that would take on this sort of uh, integrated planning role? Uh, to what extent should this or could this have been done by existing institutions? It's a great question, Bobby. And first of all, thank you. And thank you uh, to the University of Texas and the Strauss Center. Will, thank you very much for having us in the Clement Center as well. Um, it's really an honor to be here, especially with so many uh, living legends and, and folks who are uh, part of the uh, oh, intelligence Oh, I needed to say that about me? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> not you, Bobby. Much. Not you, Bobby. There's one, one thing I do want to say, though, about our, our law school class that we're, we were a privilege to be a part of. Uh, we had two classmates who died in the service of this country in Afghanistan. The first, Helga Bowes, uh, working for the CIA, who died in 2002, uh, shortly after we entered the, the, the fight. Uh, and then Michael Weston, who died on behalf of the DEA uh, in operations uh, in 2009. Uh, and so really a, a testament not only to, I think, the heroism of those uh, individuals, but also to, to that class. And I, I'm really honored to be here. Um, to answer your question, I, you know, I ca came to the NCTC in part after the reform. I was at the White House in 2005. Uh, and in many ways, I benefited from all the work that had been done in the past, that what John Brennan had done to graduate TTIC and hand it over to Scott Redd to run NCTC. So from the White House perspective, we really had uh, several things that we both demanded of NCTC and were trying to help NCTC with. 
Uh, we demanded, obviously, the threat integration analysis, which was so key and, and vital to understanding the threats as they evolved day to day and longer term. Uh, but we also had a, a, a supportive, supportive role to the function that you describe, Bobby, which is uh, the Director of uh, Special Operations Planning, which is one of these odd terms, as you heard yesterday, that was uh, devised in Congress to try to square the circle of what it is we're trying to achieve. I think some of the 9-11 Commission had envisioned that you needed some quarterback or some belly button in the, in the U.S. government that was not only going to integrate the analysis, but then figure out what to do with it. To Steve Hadley's point earlier, you know, it's nice to understand where the threats are, where the vulnerabilities are, but who, who's going to do what uh, and when? And so there was a sense that you needed a bit more choreography to how we dealt with the terrorism threats as they evolved. Uh, and in some ways, that's what DSOP was, was thought of initially. It really wasn't that, though, and it never really has become that. Uh, instead, what that role has become has really been a, an operational function from a strategic planning perspective. And the deficit here was really this, that the national security staff was, is constituted to support the National Security Council and the President. Um, and if you're going to get into complex planning, both for near-term threats and for long-term contingencies, remember, in the counterterrorism world, much of the work is, is assuming the worst. Um, then you needed staff and function that was looking not just at the data, not just at the analysis, but figuring out what parts of government were doing what. Um, and that really then became the role of, of DSOP. And it evolved over time. Uh, under different leadership and uh, given the maturation of NCTC. Let me just very quickly give you a sense of that maturation. Initially, DSOP was really charged with putting together the very first what we called National Implementation Plan, which was an attempt to take the broad strategy on the global war on terror and say, what are the objectives, what are the actions, who has responsibility for what? Um, incredibly tumultuous, very difficult to put together, but that's what DSOP did. That was important for a number of reasons. One, it established a role for DSOP uh, in, the, in the government, created a community of interest. But more importantly, it gave life to the notion that we had to ascribe budget to what we were doing. And so there was, uh, OMB became involved uh, intimately in that process. Uh, we devised for the first time strategies on countering violent extremism, the ideological fight, the nuts and bolts of what are we going to try to do to counter message or to build a grassroots counter movement or enable networks countering al-Qaeda's ideology. We built for the first time a strategy around WMD terrorism, something Michael, you and I worked on and then Matt really uh, evolved and progressed at NCTC. Um, and then that became a way of organizing the government and thinking about tasks and, uh, and uh, initiatives. It then evolved even more so, and you heard a bit of this yesterday in terms of the support that NCTC and DSOP in particular is providing to John Allen. Because over time, what you had uh, NCTC becoming was a bit more akin to an operational planner. That is to say, how do we respond to the near-term threats that are emerging, or frankly, to the threats that we're imagining but don't yet see in the traffic or don't yet see in the analysis? And so, for exa example, in the summer of 2007, there was a lot of chatter, a lot of threat, a lot of worry about what was coming around the corner. In fact, Mike Hayden uh, likened it to September 10th. 2001. Uh, and so NCTC in that context was given the role of not just understanding the threat, but also trying to organize how we thought about detecting the threat, deterring it, and even interdicting it uh, if we got to that point. And so that began an evolution for DSOP in that regard. Um, and then we also saw DSOP becoming a center of contingency planning. That is, worst case scenarios or evolutions of threats. And so one of the things we asked uh, NCTC to do starting in 2006 was to look very clearly at what we thought was a metastasizing of the Al-Qaeda movement, starting first in North Africa with Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, but you could see it starting to form with the strategic analysis happening. So DSOP and NCTC was given the role of thinking, how do we deal with the regional manifestations of this group and how do we cut it off from the core and how do we strangle it uh, before it gains momentum? Uh, and so there was a, a very neat and interesting evolution of DSOP uh, with all sorts of consternation and questions as to what it should become, uh, but at the end of the day, it really became an appendage of the NSC staff, and we very much relied upon it as a, a planning function for the U.S. government. Hey, Bobby, can I get in here? Yes. Um, so I, I think that is an excellent exact summary of exactly what 
the Directorate of Strategic Operational Planning at the NCTC did once it was put into operation. But I think it's worth going back just for a second and taking, tr trying to remember what the 9-11 Commission was trying to do through the creation of an operational planning cell at the National Counterterrorism Center. This is important today because you hear the White House is appointing an Ebola czar. It comes up in the cyber context. It came up in the Department of Homeland Security, and that's the constant struggle in Washington to try and marshal resources that are embedded across the executive branch and marshal them in such a way as to bring all elements of national power toward a strategic objective. Um, that's what the 9-11 Commission wanted to do with terrorism. They wanted to be able, in their words, to create an attending physician that while CIA was chasing down bad guys in Kuala Lumpur and FBI was looking into Islamic extremists who might be taking flight lessons somewhere in Arizona, that if these two, if these individuals from Kuala Lumpur were traveling to the United States, it, in the 9-11 Commission's mind, it should be this particular cell at the National Counterterrorism Cell at Center that would hand off the case to the FBI to make sure it was seamless. And so what they really envisioned, and the reason that a lot of people who study the interagency problems of the federal government thought they were getting, was a way to break down the stovepipes at the top and create a cell that could move across the interagency at something lower than the principal's committee level. Uh, the last thing I'll say is, and I think this is instructive, not just because of the Ebola czar and how we organize for cyber and the future of the NCTC, but there was a revolt across the executive branch at the 9-11 Commission's recommendation that there be an operational planning cell. This was the one thing everybody in the executive branch could get together on immediately. The <laughs> FBI agents, the special operators, everybody came and said, well, wait a second. Do you mean to tell me an NCTC director is going to be able to, in, as part of the plan, to go after a particular bad guy, direct FBI agents? That's, that's my job. I'm the FBI director. And the DOD said the same thing. Are you, do you mean a strate an operational plan, like you're going to go raid a safe house somewhere in Yemen? That's my job, and that encroaches upon my duties under Title 10 as Secretary of Defense. And so what they did in the Bush executive order, which was repeated in the Congress, was insert the word strategic in front of operational yeah. planning. And I'll tell you, I still don't think anybody in Washington knows what strategic operational planning means today. <laughs> So the, so the very first, I read the 9-11 report right in the very first day I got into office, I called up McRaven and Mueller and, and Petraeus and I called them all into my office and I showed them my plan for rolling up that safe house. Now we're going to lock up these guys here, we're going to move the people in this way through that door and then we're going to take them back, we're going to prosecute them here in this district. Yeah. No, it shows you kind of the absurdity, right, of yeah. that notion that that's how it would play out. It was not, it was never meant to be, I don't think, in some ways that that would be the role of the NCTC director, um, given the you know, authorities and, and capabilities of each of those organizations. But, but uh, you know, your points are really good one, Michael. It's been a challenge and, and to really define the role of DSOP, um, you know, where there's an inherent tension in uh, its stated responsibility. And, and, you know, one thing I would say, uh, you know, your mention of the Ebola czar, makes me think of this, and uh, this is a general point I've, I've thought of in my three years at NCTC, that um, in some ways the limited role of, N of, of DSOP is a uh, reflection of the success of the bro broader counterterrorism community. Mm -hmm. In other words, what, you know, what the 9-11 Commission identified as a, as a, a, uh, you know, a problem, a weakness, um, I think is no longer really a weakness in terms of the level of cooperation and, and collaboration and partnership and, and really seamless working together on operations. So there are examples, and that's where DSOP has proven itself to be very effective where we don't have that. And I can, we can talk about what those are, um, cyber operations or, or countering violent extremism, uh, some of the foreign fighter issues we've dealt with, where we play a critical role bringing the community together. But on so much of what the community does on a day-in, day-out basis, it does without the need for uh, attending physician. Uh, it, it's kind of coming naturally and organically to the community. Bobby, just a quick point on, on the duality of the function 
also being reflected bureaucratically. And something that always caused a bit of confusion in the interagency was the fact that the analytics side of NCTC, the one that makes a lot of sense, sort of fit neatly under the DNI structure, right? right. So Matt would report right. up to, uh, to the DNI for that function. But for the DSOP function, that was a, a reporting line back into the White House, back to the President, um, which was interesting for a staffer like me working for Steve Hadley uh, and the President, uh, because in some ways, you know, you could work very closely with NCTC on some of these issues. Uh, you had to be very careful not to cross any of these operational lines for all sorts of legal uh, and, and policy reasons. Uh, but it gave a, a real interesting uh, dynamic to the way that we looked at NCTC and the way that the interagency ultimately viewed its function. Just a quick point, just an anecdotal one, because when I got to uh, uh, the White House, again, I, I benefited from all the work that had been done before, and, and you heard Admiral McRaven yesterday talk about sort of the scattered way in which we dealt with terrorism threat information right after 9-11. Uh, by the time I got to the White House, um, TTIC and then NCTC uh, had built around the community uh, the, of the counterterrorism world and around a rhythm to threat reporting. And so you actually had three times a day uh, threat reporting and communication among the community, including the middle of the night. So three times a day, uh, at least once a week, deep dives on threats that were occurring, all led by NCTC, uh, convened at the White House, and then various other meetings for particular threats of concern to understand, uh, to understand who was doing what uh, to, to deal with problems. My last day on the job uh, was the inauguration of, of President Obama. I spent that day at NCTC. Why? Because we were monitoring a threat that we believed was credible to the inauguration, to President Obama. Um, and NCTC was coordinating the information around the threat, uh, was helping to coordinate how the FBI was dealing with the operatives we thought uh, might have a, a van filled with explosives. The CIA was monitoring what was happening in Somalia because we thought this threat was coming from al-Shabaab uh, in Somalia. Uh, and NCTC, in many ways, was that uh, center of continuity as the Bush team literally walked out the door and the Obama team came into power. And so my last day on the job, I was sitting at NCTC, literally watching the president um, uh, give his inaugural speech. Fortunately, the threat had washed away. It wasn't real. But we didn't know that for sure until about two hours before that moment. But that is a demonstration to me of the centrality of NCTC, because at, at that moment of potential crisis for the country uh, and moment of continuity between the administrations, NCTC was running the show. This is so interesting, because on, on paper, when you just look at the statute, it's not obvious that it will play these roles in large part because the phrase strategic operational planning is strategically ambiguous. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a placeholder. And this all seems to reinforce Director Clapper's point from yesterday uh, when I'd asked him, you know, whether you'd change anything in the statute to strengthen ODNI. And his response was, you know, we all tend to think of the legislative hammer. Everything needs a legislative solution. But his point was that a lot of times the organization in practice can evolve and flesh out and create glosses on the statute as to what it can do and become perfectly effective that way. It sounds like what you guys are saying is that NCTC has matured into an effective role without need for formal specification of what strategic operational planning actually means. Now, against that backdrop, it, it does sound like it's effective and it sounds like what it really means is in, at least in significant part a marshalling function, not unlike the attending physician vision that was originally uh, articulated. And what that makes me wonder is, what is it that gives, Matt, you as director or, or maybe the person in charge of, of DSOP, or maybe both in tandem, what are the levers of power or authority that make NCTC in general, and, and DSOP in particular, actually effective in marshalling? Well, so keep, keeping the focus on, on the operational planning role, it, um, you know, the, and, and Juan referred to this, the, the primary source of authority is the White House. And, and I think this is by design. Um, you know, this is, the, this is not an intelligence community role. This is a role that was given to NCTC where the director, where I was reported to the White House for what we did on, on the planning side. Um, and, you know, ideally, and, and this was, this is, you know, you gave a, a, a positive view, and I, and I generally agree with a positive view of DSOP, but a weakness is, that it is so dependent on who is in the White House and how the White House decides to use this organization. Right now, we have a really good 
you know, set of people, and, and I think we've proven ourselves to this, to, and you have to do that with each new, you know, set of uh, NSC folks. Um, but once you're there, then you are a force multiplier, uh, an extension of the, of the national security staff, which, you know, it does not have the resources to really run a planning, coordinating function for the counterterrorism community. So we get, we, we basically get work from the White House NSC staff. We'll see an issue like foreign fighters going to Syria. And we, and I, I say, I'll say to, um, you know, whether it's Brennan when he was in that job or Lisa Monaco or Susan Rice, you know, give us that, you know, we're, we're gonna have a meeting this afternoon. We can take this on at DSOC. Then, you know, we, we have the meeting, then we get assigned that role. Then that's the, that's the lever. We're able then to say, all right, folks, we're gonna get everyone together. We can do this. At a, at, a, at a level of resource and, you know, sort of um, in terms of pace that, that the NSC staff just can't handle. So we can really drive the planning process, bringing organizations together, assigning tasks, um, assigning lead role responsibility, um, and then doing other things that agencies don't like to do, which is talk about how we're gonna resource that. We look at the money side. And then what's even, I think, sometimes even less welcome is we can assess progress, which is a critical component of the planning cycle, but we can say, okay, in three months, in six months, how are we doing? Where are we falling short? And then report that back to the White House. And so all of those things are critical parts of this, but do depend on really the White House giving us the authority because the authority is not inherent or intrinsic in NCTC or, or me as the director. Is it possible that the DSOP function therefore could be strengthened by moving it out of NCTC and into integrating it into the NSC staff so that you always have that more organic relationship with the White House. Would that not make a difference? Uh, reasons not to. Yeah, I, I think there's lots of reasons why you wouldn't want to do that. I, I think you want to keep the NSC staff uh, function in some ways relatively pure. That is to say, you, you are the president's staff, uh, you are, you're meeting the needs of the president and his senior cabinet secretaries who are part of the National Security Council. Uh, you engage in uh, strategy setting. Uh, and I think the more that the staff, uh, and this you know, I learned at the feet of Steve Hadley, the, the more that the staff is getting into operations, yeah. the more problems you get into. We, we, it, we have had some bad experiences. Lots of bad experiences historically, and, and we may be going through some of them now. I don't know. But in any event, I think um, it, it, it bears keeping some of these functions out of the NSC. And also, you know, DSOP is not perfect by any stretch. It's filled gaps. Uh, it hasn't been able to, you know, drive certain issues. Uh, so I don't, I don't think we should be Pollyannish about it. Right. But it has been interesting to me, being out of government, that a lot of academics, a lot of uh, folks who look at uh, national security reform have really looked to DSOP as a model to think about how to cut across um, existing stovepipes, uh, arenas where there are, um, it's, there isn't a clear center of gravity to plan around. Uh, the counterproliferation context is one. Maybe pandemics help will be another. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. So, you know, I, I think there's, there's, there's strength in having this kind of function exist outside of the White House, in part because of the objectivity dimensions, but also uh, to give it weight that, that is close to some of the, the engines of, of information that are important in this context, that's NCTC. It's not a perfect model, though. Uh, and again, I think we should be realistic. It, DSOP has not been either what the original uh, framers of the 9-11 recommendations had really envisioned, uh, nor has it been a disaster the way that some thought it might be. Uh, I'm intrigued by something you said a moment ago, and I can't resist asking about it. You mentioned the a concern, maybe a speculative concern, that perhaps uh, the, the staff is, is too focused on operational matters or involved in operational matters right now. Um, do you want to elaborate on what you had in mind? I'm, I'm not going to elaborate on specifics, but I, I will say I think there is a dynamic tension uh, for policymakers, and, and Steve alluded to some of this in, in his remarks at lunch, which were fantastic. Um, you know, the, the White House is the center of gravity. The White House is where all roads lead in terms of authority, in terms of um, um, uh, political exposure, in terms of all the dimensions of, of policymaking in the national security field. And so when there's an issue, whether it's a crisis or a, a, a festering problem, the tendency is for the White House to pull those issues in. And part of that is to pull intel and analysis but there's also an instinct to try to control how uh, uh, the operations and the uh, dynamics around 
either crisis management or the operations themselves uh, are handled. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not criticizing this, but it is interesting that the, the, the picture of the bin Laden raid that most resonates is the picture in the White House sit room, right? But center, center of gravity operationally was Leon Panetta's office uh, and Bill McRaven in, uh, in the field. Uh, but the picture was of the White House. And so that's, there's a dynamic tension there because the White House needs and wants to be uh, controlling very sensitive issues, uh, needs to think about the operational implications, but at a certain point, it's only the president that has that authority and not the staff. And I think there's a real tension there uh, that every national security advisor and every president has to be wary of. Fair enough. Matt, uh, when, the, when the NCTC is performing this marshalling function, when it's herding the cats, uh, I'd imagine that not all the cats are equally cooperative. Uh, in your experience, are, are one or more of the component entities of the IC um, reluctant to, to be part of this larger integrated planning process? Or is everyone playing ball at this point pretty well? And has it changed <coughs> over time? I mean, my experience is everyone is playing ball pretty well. I mean, the, the, the imperative of 9-11 and of intelligence reform has really uh, become manifest in a very collaborative relationship among the agencies. Um, there are hard issues. You know, there are hard, hard issues that have difficult policy implications or are, um, or may, may affect a particular organization's, uh, you know, their own sort of uh, sort of tribal instincts more than others. Um, the uh, you know, and then some agencies are not used to being part of this effort. Like in this, in when we work on countering violent extremism, you know, we're bringing in sometimes agencies that aren't part of the traditional counterterrorism group. You know, maybe the Department of Education, um, which isn't used to this. And so mm -hmm. there, I think we've been able to, you know, DSOP's really proven its its worth by being an organization that can be sort of an honest broker. This is maybe a bit of the genius of not being operational, and that is, you know, not having a, an operational stake in an outcome gives uh, gives NCTC and DSOP in particular the ability to, you know, sort of step back and say, okay, we have no real stake in how this, you know, what what policy ultimately is adopted or, or, or who does what, but, you know, here's what we think makes sense, and we have a bit, you know, sort of credibility that comes with being, you know, completely, completely neutral on that. Mike, can I ask you to talk about um, where Congress fits into this picture, and in particular in terms of oversight on one hand, and on the other hand, the sort of support that, that entities can really benefit from when legislators are very familiar with their business and uh, can, can back them when their, their equities are at stake appropriately. Um, does NCTC, where does it fit in, in the congressional picture now that it exists? Is it a hipsy, sissy um, uh, entity? Uh, the Homeland Security Committees were able to get their hooks into NCTC very, very early, and they're not going to, they're not going to give it up. Um, they, um, so the, I think the NCTC has got different levels of congressional oversight. Certainly the HIPC, the two intelligence committees oversee what the NCTC does. Uh, but the Homeland Security Committees also frequently would rely on the NCTC for testimony and oversight and the rest. Um, you know, I think most of the congressional committees were sort of in on the joke when we designed the DSOP. They were more interested in protecting the prerogatives of their departments in some cases than were <laughs> the departmental yeah. entity officials who showed up at the NCTC. And so I, I honestly don't think that there is a tremendous amount of uh, congressional appreciation and support of what the DSOP mission is. I do, however, think there is a tremendous amount of support for the fusion center function the analytical function of the National Counterterrorism Center. And so I think it's uh, I think it's a mixed bag and it's split depending on what you're talking about. Okay. Um, before we move away from DSOP, I want to look at two particular things. One, I want to talk about terrorism finance and ask, ask Juan whether, uh, is this something where NCTC in your experience plays an important role? Um, or is that something that's so uniquely treasuries that it, it's not a question of involving other entities or needing coordination? That's a good question, Bobby. Um, Thank you. Uh, you know, post 9-11, Treasury was given the lead to deal with terrorist financing, to find ways of uh, deterring, disrupting uh, support to terrorist groups. Uh, and the challenge with that, of course, is 
it's not just Treasury tools or authorities that are brought to bear. Uh, the agency and the IC have a very clear role. Uh, the FBI does, law enforcement across the board. Uh, the State Department does. Uh, and so the interagency process around that developed very quickly after 9-11, but centered around Treasury. Uh, and so in some ways you had sort of a precursor to DSOP in the terrorist financing context uh, through the policy coordinating uh, council and, and process that the, the White House runs. And so that ran fairly well for a number of years. Uh, one of the things that DSOP did though, uh, and this was back in 2006 if I recall correctly, uh, they actually began to develop uh, operational plans around terrorist financing. In some ways codifying and memorializing what had already been happening but also being a bit more creative about thinking about what was to come next. And so in that context, it was DSOP and NCTC complementing uh, the community of interest and the set of actions that were already happening both domestically and internationally around terrorist financing. Uh, and so Treasury in some ways has uh, retained its primacy. Uh, part of that is because Treasury uh, is the only finance ministry in the world that has an Office of Intelligence and Analysis. Uh, built in 2004 with the creation of the Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence. Um, and that in some ways has brought further the center of gravity of these issues toward Treasury with the Assistant Secretary for those issues, for those of you who like bureaucratics, uh, also serving as the DNI's uh, National Intelligence Manager for Threat Finance, which is now the term du jour for terrorist financing. It's threat financing. Um, and so it's a great question because I think here you've had a bit of a hybrid approach where an agency that clearly has a mandate, the authorities, information that are relevant to a mission has a central role, but it's then complemented by other structures that are helpful to it. That's interesting. Does, it, does that switch to threat financing? Does that mean we'll soon have the war on threats? Is that the, is that the direction <laughs> we're in? Well, uh, actually, just, just a quick note of history, which is important in the, in the current context. I think we're going to see a, a revision of this. Um, threat finance uh, is a term that's come from the military uh, because it's a doctrine where the military, especially in Iraq and then in Afghanistan, saw that we had to understand how the enemy was resourcing itself and understand what we could do to disrupt it both uh, where the, the fight was being had and then internationally. You had in 06 and then 08 the creation of threat finance cells on the ground in Iraq and then Afghanistan. The one in Iraq was dismantled in 2011. And I would say we're about to restart that process again to understand how better to disrupt the Islamic State financing, uh, which is something uh, Stan McChrystal, Treasury, and uh, CENTCOM were doing pretty effectively on the ground in 2007, 2008. Well, and this goes back to our, our classmate um, in the role of counter narcotics. I assume there's an integration task where you're pulling together worlds that don't actually probably increasingly often do intersect and are getting comfortable working with one another. Well, par, par, uh, sorry to, for, for taking more time with this, but part of the reason Michael was in the field with the DEA raiding a site uh, belonging to Taliban nar narco traffickers was that the DA DEA had taken the lead role for the Afghan threat finance cell given to them in 2008. Uh, they were on the ground embedded with the military, working with the Treasury, uh, and part of their mission was to try to disrupt the financing uh, under, under underwriting uh, the Taliban's activities and al-Qaeda's activities in Afghanistan. Hmm. Um, so last, Matt, let me come back to you. Um, countering violent, violent extremism, you've mentioned it a few times, and of course, uh, Sharik Zuffer, who recently left that position, yeah. a UT law grad, so yeah. hook him, Sharik. Uh, <laughs> what, um, it, it, it sounds, that sounds relevant, it sounds like it's, it's timely, pertains to, um, you know, homegrown threats, but Tell us what exactly is going on under the hood of CVE, countering violent extremism. What sort of activities actually are taking place that you can talk about? Sure. I mean, I can talk about, you know, th this is an, an, an effort uh, that we, we engage at NCTC in, but we're doing this with the Department of Justice and FBI and DHS, and Quentin is here. He had a big role in this when he was at the White House. Um, yeah, and there's really no limit to what I can talk about this. I mean, this is, this is an outward-facing effort, right? To, and it's gotten the new urgency with the, all of the attention being paid now to Americans traveling to Syria. Um, but it's basically a, a, an effort to, um, to really reach out to communities around the country, uh, work with community leaders, religious leaders, um, uh, in places that we think are potentially vulnerable to the message of extremism, and particularly from NCTC's perspective, uh, Al-Qaeda's message. And 
to provide these communities and, and these leaders with the tools to understand that message and to defend against it, uh, particularly children and, and young people who might be vulnerable. Um, it, the, the other piece of it is to really work with state and local law enforcement, give them the training they need to recognize the, the signs of someone becoming radicalized and potentially mobilized to violence. Um, this is, our effort has been really, again, working as an extension of the White House is to implement a strategy that the White House adopted in 2011. And it, there was really no structure within the government to do this, and no one agency given this responsibility. We put a fair amount of resources into it at NCTC, um, and we've got a lot of really uh, bright, dedicated people working on it. Uh, and because we're NCTC and we have one mission, it's kind of easier for us to do this than it is in some ways for DHS or FBI, which has you know, so many different missions. But just as an example, I meet on about once every month or so with my counterparts, the Deputy Attorney General, Deputy FBI Director, Deputy of DHS, to, for breakfast to talk about what we're doing and how, how we're moving forward. So it's a very ad hoc kind of apparatus to, to, to drive progress in this area. You know, the Attorney General recently talked about three pilot cities uh, where we are implementing new programs. But, um, you know, the, 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 the difficulty is in this area, one of the primary difficulties is that, that the role of government is necessarily limited. You know, we're talking about messaging and, and countering a message. Uh, so we really have to figure out how to do this in a more um, extensive way by working with the private sector and, and, again, fundamentally with those communities that are potentially vulnerable. Okay, well, let's, let's turn our attention now to the, the as you, what you described as sort of the main event for, for NCTC, the Intelligence Integration Mission. And, Mike, I, I want to again begin with you by, by drawing our attention back to what was intended in the legislation originally. And, and one of the things I'm curious about there is um, why, why not rely on CIA all-source analysis? Why not modify whatever needed to be modified to make it more truly all-source? Why, why a new entity altogether, either at the TTIC stage or at the NCTC stage for this mission? Well, we, we talked about just that issue. When President Bush created the Terrorist Threat Integration Center, which is what we call TTIC, which is the Analytical Fusion Center, he put it at CIA. Um, when the 9-11 Commission came along, I think what their rationale was was that it would work better, given the traditions of the United States, that the Central Intelligence Agency shouldn't be in possession of US person information or be really a, a deep party to whatever the FBI or the DHS's activities were domestically. The rationale was, well, let's take it out of CIA and have it freestanding with the ODNI, reporting to the ODNI, um, so that we could have a new place where we could mix domestic information and foreign <coughs> intelligence. It was thought that if we invested this in the Central Intelligence Agency, it would garner tremendous suspicion and uh, eventually its mission would be undermined. Um, I think what people were going for, and, and I think this effort continues today and we can hear from Matt on this, is I think everybody is generally aware of just how many dozens and dozens of different databases there are throughout not just the intelligence community but also through the Department of Homeland Security that would have a bearing on stopping terrorist travel or locating a particular individual. And so I think what the intent of the fusion function of the NCTC is a place where all of these different portals can come together and be viewed and analyzed by a separate analytical core whose core mission is the protection of the homeland. Um, I think that's what we're going for. I think there have been, of course, bureaucratic obstacles, technological obstacles, and the rest. But my sense from uh, working on the House Intelligence Committee was th we're making steady progress over time in DHS and other people who didn't want to surrender a particular database to the NCTC have under certain conditions given up access to those databases and that has in turn improved the ability of the NCTC to track the bad guys. Juan, what did it look like from your perspective during the second term of the Bush administration? How, as it started getting off the ground, how did it perform? What kind of challenges did it face? Um, 
it, it ran very well, but there were, there were limitations, and, and limitations that, that still exist in some ways, both by law and design, but also a little bit of lore, too. Um, you know, from, from the White House perspective, uh, it was incredibly helpful and useful to have this function, uh, whether on a daily basis or more strategically, where you could say, look, this is where we need to have all the information go, whether it's domestic or foreign, to look at this particular set of problems. Um, and then to be able to rely that that's actually happening, uh, that, that the dots are being connected, however you want to call it, uh, that that analysis and work was actually happening and that the president, uh, the National Security Advisor, could be well served in terms of the decisions that then had to be made. Um, so from our perspective, that part of it worked very well. Um, the problem, though, I think sometimes with the lore around NCTC is there's a sense that it, it, it sees all and it's uh, instantaneous and all the databases are sort of fed in neatly and easily and you've got a supercomputer sort of uh, spewing out where the latest terrorist is going to come into the country, et cetera. It doesn't work that way, right? It, you still rely on uh, analysts uh, to be both intuitive and imaginative, to Steve's point earlier. Uh, you re rely on clusion systems together, which by law in many cases are kept apart, for example, American citizen data, um, and uh, rely on uh, sometimes fairly clunky analytic ways of getting at certain uh, potential problems and answers. And so um, it was a relief from a White House perspective to have some place that you could rely upon. Uh, but sometimes there was a, a sense of over-reliance uh, when, in fact, there were still gaps in the system uh, and gaps that still exist. You know, sometimes the NCTC director, and I love Matt and love Mike Leiter and Scott Redd before him, they're often called the Jack Bauer of, of the U.S. government. Um, and though Matt's a stud and Mike's a, a stud as well, <laughs> you know, NCTC doesn't work that way uh, and, and doesn't, uh, frankly, have the capabilities to, to do either on the operational side, as we've been talking about, but also on the analytics side, the kind of um, fusion of open source, private sector, and uh, all source intelligence uh, that you would assume given its, its function. So they're not the Jack Bauer or the Chloe, is what you're saying. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's right. Uh, <laughs> Matt, uh, obviously the uh, Abdul Mutalab incident, the, the attempted uh, downing of the, the flight to Detroit, was a seminal moment, right. and it, rev it prompted lots of introspection, lots of external criticism of NCTC. Uh, to what extent do you think NCTC, at that point, fairly deserves blame? Um, and in any event, what has changed since then as a result of all that scrutiny? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't I wasn't there in in uh, Christmas Day 2009, um, but uh, you know, obviously, I was aware of of the of the criticism, and I think in some ways it's a reflection of the point that Juan just made that there's a you know this this impression that uh, that we are this you know all seeing, all knowing entity that was you know set out uh, by the 9/11 Commission to be able to in immediately identify these types of threats. Um, I mean, that said, there, we, we did learn quite a bit, and it was, as you said, Bobby, a seminal moment, sort of a watershed event for us um, that, that, that sort of helped us focus on where, where we were and where we needed to go. So going back to the very beginning, you know, in 2004, where we basically just had an analyst pulled together and we just put, um, you know, each analyst had five, six, seven central processing units under their desk that they just had to log into each one of these different uh, you know, systems in order to look at different databases. And we've gone from that to a, you know, essentially a, a counterterrorism database that includes all of the CIA's reporting, including operational reporting, and includes um, really all of the FBI uh, investigative information, you know, in one place. And that really is the fulfillment in, in, in large part of the, this bold vision uh, that, that the 9-11 Commission and Congress had. In, 2004, what, what Abdul Muttalib showed, the weakness then, what we've been working on and uh, during my time at NCTC was, okay, we've got access to a lot of terrorism information. We see the reporting from NSA and CIA and FBI about who the bad guys are and what they're doing. What we don't have is this kind of access we need to what essentially is not terrorism information in the main, but may include particularly useful information about terrorist activities for example, a lot of the information that DHS or the State Department has about travel. 
Um, and we spent a lot of effort, and this was kind of the you know, sort of the next evolution of, of, of NCTC, to get access to that data in a way that we could, you know, when Abdul Matalab is trying to leave um, Nigeria, that we have insight into that, not just the, the initial report about who he was, but we start to see, okay, does this guy, somebody like this looking forward, hypothetically, does he have a visa? Can we quickly look through our databases? Does he, does he, has he made travel plans? Um, has he traveled previously? Um, getting access in quick order to that type of information, again, the vast majority of which is completely not you know, derogatory or, or nefarious, but contains within it that specific uh, nugget that we need to connect up uh, with, the, with the terrorism information to disrupt the plot. And I think that was one of the central lessons of uh, Abdul Matala. And are you saying we've gotten better at getting access, real-time access to that information? Yeah, absolutely. We've made huge headway, in, in, in and yeah. we do essentially have that type of access to that information, right. the information we think now. There's a there, the next sort of frontier is, and we've talked a little bit about this over the last couple of days. Okay, we've got all this data. Are we making full use of it? Right. Do we have the the analytic tools? Right. Uh, do we have the processes um, to? And this is a, this is not just an NCTC <laughs> problem. This is a you know, this is a, the big data problem that everybody faces. The problem of too many dots. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Too, too much information, and, 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 and can we find that piece of knowledge we need in that data? So on one hand, with, with that as a caveat, that this is sort of a comforting story of getting overcoming the technical and policy barriers to being the all-source integrator. But, but the very success in doing that is going to raise civil liberties and privacy concerns. And of course, that's something that as director, I know you had to wrestle with quite a bit. Um, can you tell us about uh, the evolution NCTC went through on your watch uh, on that dimension. Are, are we more protective of privacy now? Are we more careful of civil liberties? Is this an area that we should be concerned about at all? Mm. So, well, definitely we should be concerned about it. And, and you know, we did a lot of this work sort of pre-Snowden. Uh, and, and, and we did everything, you know, sort of above, I think, above and beyond what other agencies were doing in protecting their own data. So there was, we put at least as much protection in uh, as other agencies had in terms of privacy and civil liberties, and, and in, in most cases more, substantially more, to make sure that there were safeguards built in to protect uh, privacy and civil liberties of, of, uh, of U.S. persons. It is, Joe, it is a constant struggle. This struggle didn't just start with the NSA leaks. There was a, there was a time when I was described, I met with, with, with a big group of um, uh, ACLU and EFF and the privacy advocate groups um, and we were getting beat up pretty good. I was getting lots of hard questions, real skepticism that day about our effort to um, you know, aggregate all this data, much of which is U.S. person data. Were we protective enough? Were the intelligence community, you know, the, 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 the concerns that, that you know, we all share, um, that was in the morning. Okay? And then later that day, um, I went to a congressional hearing, uh, not, not you, Michael, different, different committee, <laughs> and, and really got beat up because we hadn't done enough uh, about uh, Zarnaev, that we had this tip from the FSB that he was an extremist, and we didn't wiretap his phone, we didn't look at his email, we didn't go in his house, and how could, and this was across the board. So in one day, I'm getting whipsawed, you know, on both, because of course we didn't have nearly enough information to do any of those things on Zarnaev. Uh, we had a tip from the FSB. Um, but it just, I think, it comes with the territory, that there's, you're always trying to find that right balance, there are going to be critics on, on both sides, and you try to do the right thing based on the facts that, that you have. So, so you've recently left, and, and our friend Nick Rasmussen, who will be with us tomorrow, he, he was unavailable because he's, because he's got this job, couldn't be here today. <laughs> yeah. um, but he's going to be with us tomorrow, I think largely because of the football game, but we'll see. Um, <laughs> I want you guys to give him some advice. Uh, Mike, we got any advice for Nick? He's got a tough job. You know, I joked with... Uh, Matt Olson recently, I was like, boy, you got out just in time, didn't you? you, you uh, <laughs> as we talk about foreign fighters coming out of Syria, <laughs> you, I was like, you've probably got two more months where you were not on any, CC'd on any email <laughs> about any particular bad guy, and then you can relax. Um, Nat, you know, the NCTC director has got a really, really hard job. Um, we've been lucky as a country, and we've been good as a country in preventing terrorist threats. Uh, in the homeland since 9-11, but boy, when, we, when one of these goes off, there is going to be a tremendous reaction, and I think a lot of it will come down on um, the NCTC and 
the new intelligence structure to, to see if it works and to give it a real road test. Um, I guess my advice uh, would be, you know, make sure you've got a lot of White House backing. I, I think that's absolutely critical when a tremendously large event occurs that the White House knows what you're doing and has your back. Um, I think that would be my main, my main bit of advice. Um, I love Nick Rasmussen. He worked with us at the White House. Uh, he's a longtime CT professional, and NCTC is lucky to have him. Matt was lucky to have him as, as his deputy. So I, um, he, doesn't, he doesn't need my advice, but um, the, a few things I would say. One, NCTC today is more relevant than when it was created um, because the terrorist threat is growing more complicated, more diverse, requires more uh, Im imagination. I think one of the challenges of the Abdul Muttalib episode was that it demonstrated again that the framing of how we think about threats can often uh, lead to some challenges and, and foibles in how we look at the information and intelligence we have. Um, and so I think you know this is a time for NCTC actually to sort of bear down because the problem is getting more complicated, more diverse. Um, you know, in in terms of real world uh, suggestions, one. Uh, tend to the people, uh, because I think the reason NCTC has been successful to the extent it has uh, has been because it, it's had good people, great leadership, uh, from Matt, Mike, Scott, uh, John Brennan, starting with TTIC. The leadership from the top has been great. Support from the White House has been important, I think. And at the senior manager level, uh, that has been critical, both in terms of institutional buy-in from other agencies like the FBI and CIA, but also in terms of the functioning. So uh, folks like, uh, uh, you know, Art Cummings, who was in charge of CT for FBI, who was the deputy at NCTC, or Andy Leitman, who was the deputy for CTC at CIA, who went over and ran analysis for NCTC. These people bring credibility, uh, they bring uh, capabilities, and they strengthen the organization. The last thing I think I would say um, in terms of the question you posed on privacy civil liberties is you're always going to get whipsawed. You know, the Abdul Muttalib episode is interesting because when I was at the White House, NCTC and we were getting crushed on the number of people who were on the watch list, who were on the no-fly list. Guess what? Post Abdul Muttalib, two times the number of people on the TIDE list, which is the broad database, 14 times the number of people on the no-fly list. Why? Because Congress demanded it. They demanded a lowering of the standards, uh, and they got, we got whipsawed. NCTC got whipsawed. So it's going to be inevitable. Manage it and tend to your people. Matt? I, I just left Nick like a 10-page memo on this exact uh, you know, <laughs> here are all the things. <laughs> the, thing, the thing that he remembers is that I left NSA just you know, right before the Snowden leaks. So yeah. he, he's not feeling that good about, yeah, great about my, yeah. About What's going to happen in Austin after you leave us? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll, I agree with all the points that Juan and, and Michael made. I mean, uh, the, the, the point on, yes, you are going to, this, this is kind of where I was going with the whipsaw point. This is, this is, the, this is the job and this is the territory. And, and it, I think a related issue and that Michael alluded to is, um, you know, there's, we're going to be criticized because it, there's, there's going to be an, uh, an, an attack of some type. And because we've done such a great job getting all this information, we're going to be able to look back retrospectively and find that piece of information that we obviously should have seen and we missed. And we're going to be criticized for that. And, 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 I, and one of my pieces of advice t and one of the things I tried to do was not – so there were those who, who would have argued and did argue, you know, we shouldn't try to get this database because if we have this database, it's going to be really hard. It's really big. It's got a lot of information. We're never going to be able to see everything in it, you know, it's, and we're going to have it, and then we're going to get in trouble when we miss something. And that's sort of – you know, that's – that's sort of thinking out of a, a sense of fear and caution that I think is not the, you know, the hallmark of NCTC. It's not the hallmark of the kind of terrorism community as a whole. It's not what we need, how we need to approach these problems. We need to embrace them, you know, do our best, know that there's going to be criticism, you know, and feel like we made the right decisions for the right reasons. We were, you know, we did our, we, we took care of our people, and that has, that's going to be a bigger struggle. I mean, we really benefit from this sort of 9-11 generation of young analysts who come in uh, to NCTC. This is what they, they could have done a lot of different things. They could have gone to Wall Street, and they chose to work at, at NCTC. Um, but we've got to continue to do that, and, and part of the way to do that, too, as a leader is to protect them by taking that heat, you know, by, by, by making, trying to make decisions for the right reasons. Um, 
and, and protecting them so they can actually do the, the real work of, of protecting the country. So let's open it up for questions. And as, as before, there will be microphones moving around somewhere in the room. We'll start with Admiral Inman here. At least I think we have microphones. Perhaps we don't. No, we do. Okay, great. It's coming. Thank you. Matt, there are two questions for you. First one is, uh, thinking back over a long career of where we've bobbled a lot of things, critical issue was lessons learned. Uh, to what degree do you have a process instilled at NCTC to go back and try to develop lessons learned? The specific thing I have in mind here is the Tarnoff Brothers Boston Bombers. Right. The second one gets to what kind of a flow or turnover do you have of these bright youngsters? After a while, you get tired working at the same problem. What kind of a process do you have to, to keep some flow and look to have fresh talent? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Admiral. The, 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 the lessons learned question, you know, after Boston, uh, we did an extensive look back at what we knew when we knew it. What you know, did we did we miss things? What and and how do we get better? We had some, one of the critical uh, you know issues that we faced was our ability to process information really quickly. If you remember, there were about five days, or four days between the bombing and the identification of the Zarnaevs, and and during that time we were struggling to really take full advantage of the information we did have. And you know, I would ask, okay, how many people in this tied database, um, you know, are in, we're in Boston, or do we have information that may have traveled to Boston during that time frame? Crunching that information, which I would have hoped, and I think the American people would expect we could, you know, half an hour, an hour to get that. You know, that was taking many, many hours, in some cases days. So that was a, a critical lesson learned. We're, we're, NCTC, one of the things that this is, we have an advantage in this regard, in that one of the things we do is um, we do planning for big events, so like Sochi Olympics uh, for the Intel community, uh, London Olympics, other big events. So we've got these. Uh, this team of people who've got a lot of experience in, in looking at processes and, and designing good processes. So we put them in charge of, of doing a lessons learned. And, and I think we came up with some, some, uh, some important you know, insights from that. Um, I think the, 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 of your two questions, the second one is one I really struggle with. So we have a huge amount of turnover uh, by design. So about half our workforce is uh, detailee. Uh, coming in from other, and we want to keep it that way. We really want to keep that joint workforce. But that means we're, every, I do the orientation every month where it's 20, 30, 40 new people in an organization of about 1,000 uh, every month. And, uh, and, that, and just you know, managing that is difficult. But then, as, as you allude to, the idea that some of these folks have been doing this for four, five, six now, you know, we're 10 years old. There are actually some, still some plank holders uh, around who were there at the very beginning in the TTIC days. You know, CT is a tough business to, uh, to do for that, at that pace uh, for that amount of time. Um, so I think the key is, at, especially for our analysts, to get them involved in going back to their home agency or giving them different opportunities to keep them fresh. And, uh, but it's, a, you know, that sort of 9-11 urgency, you can't maintain that for, you know, into our second decade. And we need to be thinking about how do we build that counterterrorism workforce for the long haul, because as Juan said, the threats aren't going away, they're just getting more complicated, and, and so we need to be in a position to, to take them on. David Shedd, uh, Steel if you could. Mine's more in the form of a comment about a beneficiary as an operational agency that has taken great advantage of NCTC. By way of that comment, I would say the access to the database of DIA analysts who are now serving in an agreement that we have with uh, NCTC. I found enormous cultural resistance at DIA to having them go to NCTC. But um, as a result of that, they're coming back in part to Admiral Inman's question about uh, these, these analysts and the, the burnout factor, if I can put words in your mouth, coming back refreshed because they've had an interagency experience. They've been, um, up and sideways with, uh, alongside of the domestic side with FBI and so forth. So somewhere on the order of 50 to 60 analysts rotating in and out of NCTC with that much broader access to databases. What do we get out of it? DIA inside the defense 
counterterrorism threat aspect is, is co-production with NCTC. And I think that's a much stronger product for you. It's definitely a much stronger product Absolutely. for us. So all by way of a comment of someone that has actually seen it, lived it, and really embraces the NCTC concept in practice. So if I could just say, this was a, a, an innovation initiative that I somewhat inherited but helped with through because of David's leadership in making happen with, uh, with DIA and NCTC. We have, this is an extraordinary uh, number of DIA analysts coming in and the goal is working together with our analysts side by side and joint production and the number of joint pieces, you know, it, especially in a time of constrained budgets, you know, that we're able to, to write so much together instead of separately, you know, in parallel, um, it serves the policymaker, it's the right thing for the American people. Uh, Larry Wright. Uh, when we talk about s national security matters, we're usually talking about threats to the homeland and so on. But and and, and uh, no doubt the the na intelligence community has done a wonderful job in protecting us in that regard. Meantime, the American business community has been under a ceaseless, remorseless attack, uh, and one could easily make a case that this is a national security matter. It, how should we? address this and how are we doing it now? What changes do you have in mind? So the, the, are you referring to cyber, basically? Basically yeah. cyber, yeah. Um, you know, we've actually had some beginnings of some discussions. I mean, you know, it's a, and I've actually said in other settings that, the, that NCTC as a general proposition holds out a, is, a, is a good model for interagency uh, coordination, fusion, integration, and synthesis. Um, in areas that are as pressing as certainly terrorism is, and, and cyber may in, in fact be one of those areas where we, you add in with cyber the, the really additional complication of it being largely a private sector problem to take on. Um, so if, if the question is sort of do we think about this as a potential approach to cyber, I think, yeah, I think we need, I think it is something that is, is worth uh, taking a hard look at. Can, can, I, can I address this in, in two ways? One, Larry, you raise a very important point. It's going to be a challenge to NCTC moving forward, which is how does not just the terrorism threat evolve, but how do these threats blend? Uh, and what happens when you have uh, actor neutral threats, uh, non state proxies uh, and state actors operating like terrorists or, uh, or using cyber capabilities or the power of asymmetry to, to attack American interests, whether private or public? I think it's a major challenge for NCTC and, frankly, the, the government because we've tended to sort of cabin these things and you look at the way we designate groups by the State Department or Treasury, you know, there's, there's a very formulaic way of doing it. A lot of these threats are beginning to blend and they're blending in some ways in cyberspace and I think that's a, that's a real challenge for the IC and NCTC in particular. Uh, in terms of a, a different approach, I, I've written a little bit about this. I actually think we've got to move to a, a different legal uh, construct and one that looks frankly to a, in some ways a cyber privateering model that is to say that is a much more active public private uh, partnership that maybe even learns from the letters of mark and reprisal of the of the 18th and 19th century where government was empowering in a more aggressive way the private sector to defend itself in coordination the problem of course in the post noden era is you have a lot of suspicion and angst in terms of that co uh, coordination and I've said, you know, one of the strategic fallouts of the Snowden affair is uh, the, the raising of mistrust between the public and private sector at precisely the time when you need uh, that kind of cooperation uh, more than ever. We have a bit of a cue here. First, we'll go to John McLaughlin, and then now uh, be to David Shanzer and Chuck Alsop. So, Steele, if you would get it over there to the director. Uh, thanks, Bobby. I, and I think Matt may have really just answered part of my question in responding to Larry. Uh, I, I'm intrigued by the strategic operational planning model, and that comes from having been involved in some exercises in town uh, where we've looked at revising the National Security Act. One of the uh, problems, I think, is that despite the hard work that takes place in the National Security Council, and no one can work harder. Uh, it tends to get overwhelmed, in my experience, if, if the problems are more than, let's say, three. Maybe more, but 
In other words, you can only have so many meetings in a day. You can only make so many decisions. Uh, as someone said to me once, I can't work any harder or sleep any less. Uh, so there's, it's a problem of physics up to a point. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the remedies that people talk about is some way to get some of that decision making uh, systematized so that by the time the White House has to engage, they're presented with options that have been thoroughly chewed over and analyzed somewhere else, uh, not necessarily by deputies or principals. And I'm wondering, uh, you guys, Matt and, uh, and Juan talked about this a little bit in your presentations, but I, let me sharpen the question a little bit. If you were transferring the strategic operational planning model to something else, having experienced it, first question would be, how would you change it to make it more applicable? In other words, what are the shortcomings of it that you've noticed? And then I'm wondering, you've talked about cyber a little bit. Is this a model that could be used for, let's say, uh, dealing with a response to Russian adventurism in Central Europe, which must cross many lines in the government? Or sorting out all of the factors that have to go into the Iranian nuclear negotiations? Or is that all a bridge too far? I'm basically looking for some way to help the White House organize itself in a more sensible way, thinking partly of something Steve Cambone said. Remember when he said, all of these institutions we have were designed to make sure that we were ready for that final 30 minutes? Well, that isn't the world we're living in now. So uh, is this a pathway toward a more sensible decision model? Uh, uh, very quickly, I, I, I mean, I, look, I think it is potentially. I, I, it's not easy, right? It's not, it, NCTC has it, been quite successful, but it, it's taken 10 years, I think, to really achieve some of the, really achieve the vision, and, and it's also been, you know, it's been difficult. So it's not, it's not something that's easily transferable. I, I think your, your, your central observation uh, of the national security staff and, and the White House, it, that, it, that there are only so many issues, and, and it's probably in the neighborhood of two, three, four, that it can really be focused on is a reason why, you know, with respect to NCTC and our operational planning role, we really play a critical function, especially when you're not talking at, about Iraq and Syria. So Iraq and Syria right now has got the White House's attention. You know, we are supporting that. But in the meantime, we have a lot of people working on, you know, on, on Libya and, and, and North Africa that's fallen off of that, you know, top tier of issues, but needs to be continually monitored and, and uh, you know, it's where the effort needs to be continually fostered. Um, so I, I agree with your central observation, I, you know, I, whether what the, what the other sort of uh, area where DSOP or that kind of role would be effective, I, cyber does come to mind because you have such disparate uh, organizations trying to come together and it's, and it's, been, it's been a real struggle for the government. But I, I, again, I, do, I would be, I guess the, my other thought, as I said, is that it's not easy. It's not just something you can just easily transfer. It takes a real significant effort. Just real quickly, we, we had experimented with DSOP serving a bit of a function in the cyber context back in 06, 07. We don't talk a lot about that, but um, it was an attempt to do exactly what you described, John, which is take some of the technical discussions which would occupy deputies and principals time and say, you know, go work on the options and, and the technical questions. And then when you've got the real policy questions, let's elevate those. And so there was a, an attempt to do that. Um, I think, I think in general that's a good idea, and I, as I said before, I think the DSOP function, when it's working well, is providing sort of real-time uh, support, but is also working on longer-term planning and contingency planning for when those issues aren't on the front burner, but assuming they will be at some point. And so you'll have a, a group of planners or a set of act actions uh, set forth. One, one idea that um, you know, we've talked about is can you take and adopt the DSOP model and inject it into a lead federal agency, uh, a department or agency that has a primary role. You know, for example, terrorist financing with Treasury. Mm -hmm. uh, and to the extent that there's a necessity of interagency planning, could you adopt a DSOP-like body that's interagency but really serves the cabinet secretary that has lead legal policy and political authority over a particular issue? Um, that may not work in all instances, but that's, that's an alternative model to creating something independent or trying to inject it into the White House or giving NCTC another role that has nothing to do with terrorism. Um, so that's, that's something to think about. But at the end of the day, I think you're right. The White House, White House sort of tends to 
uh, take the big issues, it has to, um, and there are limits to, uh, to what it can ingest and, and decide. Dave Shanzer. Hi. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, two kind of Homeland Security uh, related questions. Uh, the first is about the uh, regional fusion centers. Uh, there's been a lot of reports criticizing uh, them, and uh, my impression has been sometimes they had a lot of structure but not a lot of uh, intel to fuse. Uh, and I'm wondering, uh, you know, Matt, you have a fusion center, but you're not the only federal entity that has fusion centers. You know, uh, at what point do we, you know, with you have weapons, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, when do we have uh, mass proliferation of fusion centers? Is, and does that, <laughs> does that ever get to be problematic uh, from you, both uh, with respect to the regional fusion centers and then other agencies around town that have them? And the second question is kind of related is about how DHS plays in this intelligence fusion role. Uh, Mike Allen is the historian uh, here, but just to inject a little bit of history, the Homeland Security Act was passed in December 2012, and it was around January of, uh, sorry, uh, 2002, uh, and it was around January that the President announces the creation of TTIC, uh, and much of the conversation in Congress uh, when I was there working on the Homeland Security Act was about this intelligence fusion uh, function, and there was a lot of anticipation that was going to be built in the Department of Homeland Security. Right, right. And what happens is the president, I think wisely in his view, uh, uh, you know, especially in retrospect, decides that, no, we're not going to put this important function in an agency that is really just getting up to speed. Uh, we're going to create something else, and that's where TTIC came from. But before Tom Ridges got, had even found out where his keys were to his office, that function was kind of ripped out of DHS, and that Office of Intelligence Analysis has done, a, you know, had a lot of churn over this period and a uh, struggle for its own identity. So I'm just wondering if you can comment about how that entity has matured and how it fits into the things that you've been discussing uh, this afternoon. So let me just hit the Fusion Center question first, and you, Michael. But uh, so look, I think we're pretty well organized at the federal level in terms of NCTC's role as on terrorism information, and that's there's not really a there's not really an overlap or any kind of, uh, you know, uh, disorganization from a fusion center point of view uh, at the federal level. The, I do think, look, the, the, the regional local fusion centers, they're, they're, there's a wide variety. Some are quite good. Some, you know, are, are struggling to be more relevant. And I, I've traveled a lot around and met with a lot of the folks at, that run these centers. Um, you know, I think the, the broader challenge, and Clapper referred to this a little bit, is, is trying to figure out how we're organized from a counterterrorism perspective when it comes to the inside the United States. How well is information flowing from a vertical perspective from the police officer on the street to the, to the uh, a fusion center, to the Joint Terrorism Task Force, to the sort of national intelligence apparatus that, that we uh, are a, a part of. The one, we've done a number of things at NCTC to, to help out there. Um, with that flow of information, but the one I, I would, would mention right now is a, an organiz a, a small element within NCTC called the Joint Counterterrorism Assessment Team, JCAT, um, which is a detailee opportunity for state and local police officers and firefighters to come, come spend a year or two at NCTC. They get all the clearances, they work side by side with our analysts, they read the classified information and, and analysis, and then they rewrite it or repurpose it in unclassified format so it can be put up on a bulletin board in a police department or a fire station. So one person who's going to do that, I just met, Matt Rush, is an Austin firefighter, a captain with the Austin uh, Fire Department, who's going to join NCTC in, in a, a month, next, soon. Um, but so this is an example of somebody who, you know, bringing that local knowledge, that local insight to NCTC, sits with our anal analyst, tells them what matters to his community so that we can be a, a better partner with them. And that's a, it's a small effort, but I think it's a, you know, kind of punches above its weight. It's really important. I, I, th I think you're exactly right. I mean, when you, we wrote the Homeland Security, when Congress wrote the Homeland Security Act in 2002 and created an intelligence office in the Department of Homeland Security, the people that were writing it believed it would become the Fusion Center. And that was not where I think uh, people in the executive branches' heads were about a Fusion Center. Um, this has contributed I think, as you've alluded to, to a real mission confusion problem about the intelligence office at the Department of Homeland Security. 
what is their role. They have, they'll, they'll cite the statute and show you where we have broad um, authority to converse with state and locals and to collect and uh, put together different amounts of information, but they don't really do that and they're feuding with the FBI. Um, you know, I've, I've said it in a couple different settings here in the last two days, that essentially I think there's reorganization fatigue. I don't think there's a real desire in the place of the Congress to take up something like this, but I think this is an area that really needs to be fixed. There are real lanes in the road problems between the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI. What do fusion centers do? What does the JTTF do? Should they be combined to really sort of reinvigorate this idea that we need to be able to collect information at the state and local level that might have relevance at the federal level as we, you know, hunt terrorists or whatever the case may be. So, no, I think you're on to something, and this is a, a, a problem some people are aware of in Washington and beginning to start trying to put the intellectual capital together to say, hey, you know, this, this, is, this is messed up and needs to be fixed. Bobby, I, just on this last point, I, I think there's a real opportunity for the intelligence office at DHS if it doesn't play me too, right? If it isn't trying to replicate what NCTC does or the FBI or CIA, uh, for two reasons. One, we need an intelligence center or, or a set of analysts looking at systemic risk to the United States that in some ways is actor neutral. Say, you know, what, what are the threats to our uh, electrical grid, uh, to the financial system? How do we think about those threats and how do we think about redundancy? That's the role of DHS in many ways and that's a key role that the Office of Intelligence can serve, more, as, more of a systemic mm -hmm. set of threats as opposed to following particular actors or groups. Secondly, and this is to Steve uh, Hadley's very important point at lunch, which is um, the intelligence community, I, th I think, still does not do a good enough job of thinking about uh, intelligence as broad scope information and in particular around communities of interest that have deep knowledge about their own vulnerabilities and activities. Uh, I'll give you an international example just very quickly. Um, I met with some folks last week who are fo focused on the Islamic State's uh, exploitation of the antiquities trade. Uh, they're taxing it, they're um, in league with some of the looters, uh, and they're actually now running some of the operations. The folks who know most about this are the people who not only worry about the antiquities trade, but the uh, archaeologists who are in Syria and Iraq. And a couple of those people knew the names of the Islamic State archaeologists, the configuration of the office, the heavy equipment that they're running, uh, and where they're running the sites. That comes from a community of interest that obviously cares about an issue and can be a source of uh, great information. That's the kind of thing that DHS could do in the context at least of a domestic uh, private sector outreach that's a bit more robust and creative. Okay. Our last question will go to uh, Chuck Alsip, our co-host, co-organizer co from uh, INSA. Uh, hi, Matt. This uh, question is going to be mainly for you, but I would welcome the, the comments of the others on it, too. But the, um, uh, one of the reasons ENSA was uh, very happy to partner uh, on this conference uh, was the opportunity to have a meaningful dialogue outside of Washington uh, on the realities of intelligence activities in this increasingly complex networked digital age. The, uh, we were reminded yesterday by Director Clapper that uh, the Snowden revelations uh, significantly affected uh, the, uh, the methods uh, that uh, uh, terrorists and others were using to communicate. Um, we've heard a lot in the last day or so from Director Comey uh, about the potential effects of uh, the encryption of uh, some of the telecommunications that Apple or, and others are doing. So can you give us a sense of how this affected the quantity and quality of information you had available to you and what challenges this presents for the IC and the nation moving forward. Yeah, so the, and I'll just shorthand your, your question, Chuck. It's a huge question and a, and a huge issue. And, uh, in, and essentially the question is, you know, how have uh, the, you know, sort of the implications and fallout from the stolen NSA documents 
affected our collection for and what we see from a CT perspective and what are the challenges uh, going forward. So, um, you know, there's a number of ways in which it's affected us. So the first, you know, the, the and is the operational impact. And, and what we've seen is the adversary, the, the targets that we're tracking, they're reading the press that we know they are they are adapting their ways of communicating to what they're learning from what they're reading. So they are uh, adopting more encryption. They are changing you know, s service providers. Uh, in some cases, they're going dark altogether. Now, you know, they, uh, they have always suspected that we had some capability to conduct surveillance, right? They've always been somewhat wary. But there's n you know, no doubt from what I've seen in specific instances where they have altered what they're doing at an increasing rate and to an increasing degree, in other words, a higher degree of communication security in, over the last year. And that's, you know, we've lost communication collection because of that on, on important targets. Um, that's short term and maybe medium term, I suppose possibly long term. We're going to work very hard to regain that kind of access. Uh, but then there's, you know, longer term fallout, the, the one that, that Director Clapper mentioned and, and Director Comey as well in terms of the sort of paradigm shift that seems to be taking place in terms of our relationship with uh, providers, the internet service pro providers and the communication companies, you know, where as before, if you had a lawful order um, and you presented that to them, I did this when I was at the Department of Justice, there was no question about compliance. Now it seems to be that it's the opposite. There, there, it, it, is a, uh, it is the position of these companies not to comply, or at least to, to really make it difficult for the government to, to obtain compliance. There's not a, a sense of cooperation. That's a longer term problem and that we're gonna have to really focus on, uh, on addressing. And then the last thing I'll mention, and probably the more far reaching uh, problem in, is the, the uh, erosion of trust that's been the consequence of the fallout, the trust with the American people, that really what the com companies are doing is reflecting. And we're gonna have to be, uh, again, more transparent because that transparency will lead to, to more trust, which will lead to more legitimacy for what <coughs> we're doing, and that will allow us then to have the authority we need to, to do what's necessary to, to carry out our activities and protect the country. But, and we'll get there. It's just gonna take, we're gonna have to be a little more transparent uh, and, and, we'll, and over time we'll regain that trust. But we definitely have lost, uh, you know, no doubt we've lost some of that trust that we had that makes our job much more difficult. We will resume at four o'clock for a fascinating panel on the jihadi terrorist threat. Uh, let's thank our panelists for a very informative session. Thank you. Thank you.